So uh, imagine this. So Jesus has been teaching and preaching, doing healing ministry. Numbers of people have been taught by him. And, uh, and now all of a sudden, Jesus is wanting to get together with his disciples, much like he did in the, in the gospel lesson from last Sunday. But large crowds of people are wanting to come and to be with him, to hear the additional things that he has to teach, and to, to, to see the, the healing and the miracles that Jesus is going to be doing in, in their lives and in the lives of the people that, uh, that, that they care for. And so large numbers of people um, come. We're told 5,000 men and that doesn't include women and children. So a large number, thousands and thousands of people who would be coming to uh, Jesus and these, uh, these you know, 12 disciples of his. And so Jesus looks out at, uh, at the crowd of people that's there. And, and Andrew is the unsuspecting disciple that's standing there with him. And, uh, and, or, or, and Philip, I'm sorry. And Philip is the one who's standing there with him. And, uh, and Philip, it turns out, is, is the, the disciple that's from that area, Bethsaida, and so he would have known kind of the resources that were in the area. And he, he turns to, uh, to him and he says, um, so, uh, Philip, um, you know, where are we going to get enough food to be able to feed all of these people? Uh, Jesus, did I hear you right? And he said, yeah, yeah, uh, Philip, so there's all of these people, they're coming, you know, they have needs, and, and we're going to do ministry with them, we're going to teach, and we're going to preach, and we're going to heal, and all kinds of things, and, and they're going to need to be fed, so where are we going to get enough food for all of these people? People as far as the eye can see, where are we going to get enough food for them? And, uh, and Philip just looks at him, and um, so this is one of the places in the Gospels where you can tell uh, that there is a, uh, there's something that's going on in somebody's head, but there's also what comes out of their mouth. And what comes out of his mouth is, well, Jesus, we, you, know, you could use a year's worth of wages and you wouldn't be able to feed all of these people. I mean, that's ridiculous. What's going on in his mind is, are you crazy? <laughs> I mean, give me a break. This is insane. You're just, this, you're just setting us up for this disaster. And so then Jesus begins to have the people sit down and begins to move into a whole different way of being able to, re to relate. Um, now, it's interesting. Jesus, there was no expectation on the part of the people who were coming to him that he was going to put out this spread, this meal for them. And yet Jesus is the one who asks that of the disciples. And Jesus, all of a sudden, because of that simple question, puts the disciples into crisis. There's a crisis that he evokes in the lives of the disciples in their minds because he's asking them to do something they possibly cannot do, that they just don't have the resources to be able to do. But he's asking them to do it. And so he's creating this crisis in their hearts and in their minds. You know, it's kind of what Jesus does. It's kind of what Jesus does with us. You know, so... If you, if you listen to the teaching of Jesus, you recognize you know, that Jesus is for those who give their lives to him, for those who trust him and love him and, and want to serve him and to follow him. Jesus is asking us to do nothing less than to change the world, to be able to allow our mouths, our hands, our feet to be the outflow of his love and power into the world to be able to go to those who are enemies and to be able to say, I forgive you and I love you and I'm going to do whatever it is that I can to bless you. Um, for those who are sick and hurting, to be able to say, you know, I, I'm going to do my best to be able to help you to have a normal, flourishing life. To be able to look at the social structures and the evil that's in our world and to be able to say, this cannot stand. It is not the way that Jesus' kingdom works in this world, and so we will do everything in our power to oppose you and to create a different kind of world. Well, so if you believe that, if you kind of you listen to the teachings of Jesus and you say, gosh, you know, that's exactly right. Jesus is calling us to that kind of a life. Then all of a sudden it creates a crisis, doesn't it? It creates a crisis in, in your life. It's like, have you seen my family? <laughs> They're crazy. You want me to do that there? 
Or have you seen, you know, the school that we go to and that's a part of? I mean, there are all kinds of things that are good that happen there. I, but what do I have? I can't do anything about that. Our neighborhoods or our friends or the people who are around us. And all of a sudden we look at what it is that Jesus asks us to do. And we look at the situation around us and we say, Jesus, good idea. But are you crazy? I can't possibly be a part of that. There is a crisis that Jesus intentionally raises up in the lives of the people who follow him. And so then the question becomes, what do we do about that? How do we do that? And so Jesus is willing to walk with his disciples through this period of crisis that he started. You know, it's his fault <laughs> that he raises up a group of people that want to change the world. It's his fault. We're only just trying to follow him and trying to put it together as we walk through it. And so he says, well, what do we got? What do we got? And so there's this one little boy who comes forward with, with a basket, right? And he says, um, now here's, I guess, a question. You know, this little boy with the five barley loaves and a couple fish, um, do you think that he actually came forward willingly to give his lunch? <laughs> or do you think that, um, that he was kind of hiding back in the crowd and one of the disciples kind of grabbed him? Here's food! <laughs> here's food! I don't know. But I, I kind of like to think that he came forward willingly. And unlike the disciples, he had his lunch and he said, here, I'll give this. And so Jesus is willing to take that. You know. Now, it's interesting then to be able to ask the question, when is it that Jesus has created a crisis in your life and he's, he's forced you to be able to have honest conversations with him? Honest argumentative conversations about, God, I can't do that. I've only got just this little bit. And to allow Jesus to walk you through what that looks like. I don't know about you, but um, uh, whose life stories you read and the kinds of things that, you, uh, that you're interested in. I'm a pastor. That may surprise you. I don't know. <laughs> um, but so I read sometimes stories about pastors and pastors' lives. And, uh, and one of the interesting um, stories that's out there for me um, was a guy by the name of Paul Yonggi Cho. He was the pastor of a church in, in South Korea, in Seoul, South Korea. Um, he planted a church in his early, so this is in the early 1960s. He planted a church um, in Seoul. Um, and at the very first worship service, it was he and his family. That was who was the church. And then from that point on, they started praying and to asking the question, you know, so God, what is it they felt like, you know, God, really, you want us to change the world? And so they began to go out and knock on doors and to be to began to invite people to come and to be a part of this church. And so pretty soon they had uh, more than a handful and then they had 50 people who came and then they had 100 people and then they had a couple hundred people. And over a period of several years, it grew to a congregation of about 2000 people. So it was, a significant, uh, it was a significant congregation, people who came together over a fairly short amount of time and, and who were excited that his ministry, at what it was that he was doing, he was a workhorse, you know, pull, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of guy. He was working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing all of the stuff that he felt like you were supposed to do. And then he got sick. He got so sick he couldn't stand up and preach. He couldn't carry on his responsibilities, and that sickness lasted for a period of 10 years. Um, the leadership um, in, in his church were a, a, a board of, of, of deacons, they called them. And so then this board of deacons, they began to talk about, you know, is he going to be... Is he going to be able to stay as our pastor? And, and they begin to be concerned because he was so central to this congregation that things would begin unraveling and people would begin kind of getting lost and lose focus. And, uh, and so the pastor, Paul Yonggi Cho, began to pray. And he said, you know, God, you, you raised up this church. What is it that we're going to do? How is it that we, can, that we can provide for the needs of the people who are coming? I can't do it. I'm sick here in bed. It's frustrating for me. What is it that I'm going to do? And he felt like God was telling him, Raise up leaders. Raise up leaders. Empower other leaders. And he said, that's it. 
And so he called the, the, the deacons of the church, the male elders of the church together, and he, he described how it was he felt like he needed to empower them to do ministry, to go out into the neighborhoods. And so the preaching and the teaching, he'd, he'd give the, the lessons to, for them to be able to teach, but the preaching and the teaching and all of the things, the, the healing ministry, all of those things would be things that they would help do. And, uh, and they said, oh, you know, that's really a good idea. Problem is, you know, I got this career thing. You know, so I'm, I'm in the office all day and I'm working really hard. And also, uh, in terms of being able to, like, you know, not use just the church building, but to be able to meet in people's homes or do things like that, you know, I, you know um, people just don't do that. They don't meet in small groups in people's homes. It, so while I think it might be a good idea, you know, we just can't really be a part of this. And so it created then again this crisis, this new crisis that happened in his life. And it's like, oh, God, you're just driving me crazy. You want to change the world. You want to use me somehow to be able to do it. And it just, I, I have nothing. I have nothing. I have nothing to be able to do, to be able to do this. And, uh, and then suddenly, in this prayer argument that he began to have with God, do you ever argue with God in your prayers? You know, I argue all the time with God in my prayers. And, uh, and so he was arguing with God in his prayers, and, uh, and all of a sudden he heard um, God say to him, felt like God was speaking to him, saying, um, lift up and empower the women. And he said, Jesus, I don't, I, you know, so you may be in charge of the cosmos and the universe, but you really don't know much about South Korea, do you? Because in South Korea, it was a pretty male-dominated culture, pretty hierarchical. So the things of responsibility were things that the men did. And the more domestic things were the things that the women did. And there was a clear division between men and women. In fact, in most South Korean churches at the time, and still it happens, um, if there's a traditional um, South Korean church, the women sit on one side of the church, and the men sit at the other, in, the, in the other side of the church, and there's a curtain between the two. And you can't even see each other. From the other side of the curtain. And so he, and he as a South Korean male, is saying, this can never work. How in the world would it be possible for the women of this church to be able to do the ministry, the full ministry of the gospel? And then he had this dialogue, and he felt in his prayer that, uh, that Jesus was talking to him. And, uh, and he says, uh, the Lord began to speak to me, and he says, Yagi Cho, from whom was I born? Uh, from a woman, Lord, I replied. And on whose lap was I nurtured? Uh, a woman, Lord. And who followed me throughout my ministry and helped me meet my needs? Um, women, I said. Who stayed until the last minutes of my crucifixion? Women. And who came to anoint my body in the tomb? Uh, women. Um, who were the first witnesses to my resurrection? Women. And, who, and to whom did I give the first message after my resurrection? Mary of Magdala, uh, a woman. To all of my questions, he said, you have answered a woman. Why then are you afraid of women? During my earthly ministry, I was surrounded by dear, wonderful women. So why shouldn't my body, the church, be surrounded and supported by women as well? That was the turning point in his struggle. And so all of a sudden, he didn't know how to do it. But he turned to the women who were part of the, the women's guild at the time, and he called them together. And he said there were 20 of them. And he said, I don't know how to do this. There's no book for doing this, but I want to kind of deputize you, ordain you to do ministry under, under, the, under my authority as, as pastor of this church. So I'll provide the teachings, I'll, we'll have curriculum for you, but I want to, to send you out to be able to do ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. And so they got a map of Seoul, Korea, they divided it, because there were 20 women, they divided it into 20 sections, and each one of those women took responsibility for one of those sections for the city of Seoul, Korea. And they went out and they met in people's homes in small groups. They, they had a curriculum. They studied the Bible together. They prayed together. They asked for God to heal people. When there was a crisis in somebody's life, they responded to that crisis. They provided educational opportunities. They did all of those things. And far from unraveling, 
the church grew. It doubled in size. It tripled in size. It quadrupled in size. And to our day, right now, it's now the largest congregation that I know of in the world. Over a million members are a part of that congregation throughout all South Korea. It is astounding what happens when we allow Jesus to create a crisis in our lives. The scary question really is, what would have happened if Paul Yonggi Cho hadn't gotten sick? The scary question is, what would have happened to that church if he hadn't met his limits? We think limits are our enemy. For Jesus, they're the opportunity to be able to focus on how it is that he can provide for our needs. And so you can imagine on that day, um, I had just this little basket that this little boy graciously was willing to surrender into the hands of Jesus. And he, and he takes the bread and he gives thanks for it and he breaks it and he sends it out into, into the crowd. And, uh, you know, how, does, how do miracles work? I have no idea how they work. I don't know what happens in the molecules. I don't know what happens in the social structure of the people. But, but people begin to be fed. And there's more. And there's more. And there's more, and there's bounty, and the disciples are part of the very distribution of this bread. They're part of seeing through their eyes, through their hands, what it is that God himself is doing through the hands of Jesus as they submit to Jesus' power, as they obey, even though it doesn't make any sense, they distribute the bread, and then Jesus says to them, now I want you to go out and pick it up, right? Go out, we don't want any waste here, so I want you to go out and pick up the bread that's left over. And so the disciples go out, and they begin picking up the bread. And so, I mean, how much can there be? So they take a basket, and I need a helper. Could, could you come help? Yeah, come on up. Just come stand right here. And so one of the disciples goes out and, and picks up, and there's a, there's a basket of bread. But, but wait, just, there's more. There's more. So then... Um, another disciple goes out and grabs a basket and, and fills the basket. And um, there's more. So they go out and they begin to collect. And it comes and it keeps on coming and it keeps on coming. And there's more. And so Jesus begins to enlist them all. They all have to be involved. They all have to somehow participate. All somehow be a part of. All somehow, oops, oops, oops. All somehow beginning to kind of wonder what, now it's not, do we have enough, but can we possibly pick it all up? Come on up. There you go. There you go. There you go. Come on. Come on. No, you got to come up here. <laughs> and there's more, and there's more, and there's more. Now, let me ask you this question. <laughs> How many disciples were there? How many baskets left over were there? Isn't that an amazing thing? Isn't that an amazing thing? From just so little... All of a sudden, the disciples are willing out of obedience just to do it, and they see this tremendous thing happen. How's it happen? Who knows how's it, how it's happened? It's above our pay grade. But God responds, and he provides, and miracles happen. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> and lives are changed. And as we do that, as we, as his disciples, his followers do that, it's not just that somehow we exhaust ourselves in the work, but one of the wonderful, tender things about this story is that each one of us is taken care of. Our needs are taken care of. So each one of the disciples gets their own basket. You know, they didn't have enough, remember? And now all of a sudden, they not only have enough, but they themselves have enough. So can you imagine them, you know, over the next day or two, just kind of sitting there with this basket of bread that they didn't bring, and all of a sudden, you know, they're just, they're feeling a little hungry, and so they reach into the basket and they eat a piece of this bread that came from the hand of God, and they taste it, and it tastes good, and it satisfies them, and they look at this basket and they say, what in the world just happened? 
what in the world did God do? And I am so glad, so glad to have been a part of it. Isn't it wonderful? It is, you know, doing the work of Jesus, following him, is not a burden. It is a joy. It is an opportunity to see God do tremendous miracles, to be able to be used by him and to be able to be fed by him and to see him change the lives of the people around us. Amen. 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 Thank you, helpers.